Hey minions, welcome to Crank It Up. I'm Jim Price, and this is a new series called Teaching Power, where I go over some of the strategy aspects of Smash Up. This is something that I've wanted to do for a long time, but I've avoided for a number of reasons, one of which is the fact that I've been told by some players explicitly that they don't like being told strategy, which I get to a degree, but this channel has always meant to be a resource for new players, and at least 100 times someone has told me that they learned so much from Crank It Up, so why not do something specifically for new players? That's what we're doing today. Today's video will be focusing on basic synergy types. At its core, Smash Up is a game where you pick two factions and smash them together, and that is the first and arguably most important decision you make in the game. I often like to say that games aren't won in faction selection, but they are lost in that moment. And even though I will talk about three basic categories, these types aren't inherently stronger than the other, as each have their strengths and weaknesses. Also, this isn't a complete categorization of synergy for every possible combo, a definition that some people are extremely particular about, but rather an easily digestible basic categorization. Also, I consider these to be attribute-based rather than hard categorizations, as some combos can blend various categories together depending on which cards you line up from them. To see what we mean, we have to look at the five basic categories, three of which I'll cover in depth. The first is bidirectional. Colloquially, these are symbiotic combos that I call have-have, because each one has what the other is looking for, largely due to being seemingly archetyped. The second is directional. The direction is a matter of perspective, which is best explained by example, and I'll get to that in a second, but the idea is that one side is looking for a specific thing that the partner is providing. The third is non-directional, which I call need-need. This is a setup where two sides have specific needs that the other fits pretty perfectly, often filling that need indirectly rather than explicitly. The remaining two types of combos won't be covered in as much detail, which are non-synergy, often two strong factions playing their own independent game plan, and anti-synergy, where factions actively conflict with each other. For an example of non-synergy, think most Frozen combos, where Frozen is capable of its own game plan, and the other faction just doesn't get in the way, even if it doesn't directly benefit them. Before I get to the examples, one faction either helps, hurts, or has no effect on another, and it's the extent to which it helps that are the three categories that I'll be talking about in depth. I'll start with have-have combos, because these tend to be the most obvious on paper, and players are always drawn to them because they are easy to make. You can start with a single mechanic, like base modifiers, and grab another base modifier faction, and there's your combo. To see this at a card level, you have the mechanic, which wants base modifiers to play, which the steampunks have. But if you pair them with Incas, your pool of base modifiers just rolls considerably. Similarly, Incan Engineer draws base modifiers from the deck, but Incas can run out of them due to their card draw, making the Incan Engineer potentially a dead card. However, when you add in the Steampunks and their 7 base modifiers, this is much more likely. Each faction has base modifiers, but also benefits from the pairing. This paradigm repeats for Swarm on Swarm combos like Robot Horses, Minion modifiers like Cyborg Apes and Nightmare, Power Counters like Kung Fu Ants, and many other archetypes. This is even the basic premise behind Dwarf Thieves and Mage Monsters, as esoteric as treasures and monsters can be. In my experience, these types of combos, especially Swarm on Swarm, can be among the most powerful in the game. So why do I say that this type isn't inherently stronger than the others? Because games aren't played in a vacuum, and there are drawbacks. One of the strengths of this setup is that it is relatively draw order dependent, unless the faction itself has a problem. If you draw the minions of one and actions of another, more often than not, you are okay. If you draw all of one card type, that's a problem that generally goes beyond the combo level, but you are still insulated from most draw permutations. However, there are some key flaws. These types of combos are easily counterable. The classic counters that come to mind are Secret Agent and Eliza and comparable cards. If you play a ton of actions, you bleed cards. If you spam cards, you can't, and if that is all you can do, if you have no diversity to your deck, it's easy for one faction to shut down both of your choices. Additionally, if you are facing a situation where a given strategy is ineffective and you have no diversification, your deck won't work. Two antagonistic factions are shut down by protection. Bases that don't match your archetype mean your plays are limited. While I think the benefits tend to slightly outweigh the drawbacks, Steampunk Incas earn the name Stinkas for a reason. In their 2020 March Smashness matchup, they had extreme power potential, draw potential, and perfect synergy alignment, but they couldn't touch their opponents, and that ended up being the downfall. Deck diversity is a good thing, and these combos often lack it, but above all else, I personally find these combos to be predictable, which is why I rarely feature them on the channel. 
when a new deck playing faction comes out, of course people will pair them with penguins, but where's the creativity? Creativity doesn't win games though, only theme can do that. Another drawback is that you might not accomplish anything. This is particularly true of destruction combos that just try to control the game. Even if you succeed in destroying everything you see, you are at the mercy of burst combos and zero to breakpoint strategies. So again, these combos are very counterable. The next type is have need. And my unscientific estimate would say that the vast majority of above average combos fall into this category because you can only permute the same archetype so many times. For me, early examples of this paradigm are zombie robots and killer plant aliens. When you look at the zombie lord, it has subpar minions of power 2 to play from the discard pile, but robots shine there. Zombie lord into Zapbot is incredibly strong because it changes the restriction of the zombie lord play. For killer plant aliens, sprouts don't have great targets for themselves, but invaders are phenomenal sprout targets. Killer plants have extra plays in searching but nothing to do with them, but the aliens fit that mold nicely. In the have need context, killer plants need play and searching targets, which the aliens have. As I said before, this can often be reversed to the same effect. Aliens need a way to ensure access to their best minions, and killer plants have that. Whichever direction you go, it's a consistent through line of one specifically feeding the other. I often view this as one faction supplying the missing ingredient to make the other faction fire on all cylinders. Dinosaurs need extra action plays. They also need extra minion plays. They need card draw to counter their internal imbalance. If the partner faction has at least one of those things, it's generally going to go well. You tend to find these combos when searching is involved, or power cap plays, or when recursion or card draw are musts. These combos can also be extremely strong, but are subject to draw order dependencies. Usually 50% of the faction lines up with the other, so if you draw the wrong 50% of each side, you can have a really hard time. One strength is that they are prone to spamming great cards, especially when recursion is involved, but if you deal with that card, then it is much harder to do anything. As I mentioned before, it's possible for combos to have non-zero amounts of each categorization. An example that comes to mind of the first two is Killer Plant Truckers. They have just enough base modifiers to fit that bi-directional style, but they also have the very clearly one-sided overgrowth play, and it's the combination of game plans that made them so dangerous rather than one-dimensional. They ended up losing to a clear have-need combo in the form of Giant Ant Pirates, the same combo that beats Stinkas. The pirates need a way to power themselves up so that they can go infinitely nuclear, and the giant ants provide it, but there isn't really something that the pirates give giant ants independently, other than not being around to blow them up. The final category for today may be the hardest to envision, but these combos do work, and I personally found them to be among the most enjoyable because of the creative challenge. I've been told directly by some players, in some not so nice words, that these combos aren't synergistic, because those people have a narrow view of what synergy is, and I think that synergy extends beyond card text. For need-need combos, it's not about lining up the words perfectly. It's about acknowledging that factions have weaknesses. Instead of emphasizing strength, it is perfectly viable to address a weakness. For me, the most famous example of this includes all the arguments and baggage that the combo generated for many players before they even saw it, and that is Kaiju Innsmouth. I built the combo on the idea that Kaiju need minion plays desperately. Innsmouth desperately needs action plays. Each one has what the other is looking for, but it isn't driven by card abilities. Innsmouth ensures that the Kaiju always have a minion to play. Kaijus always have actions to play. It is driven by circumstance. I think a lot of good stalling combos fall into this realm as well. For a slower faction that has power potential but needs time, they need a means to slow the game down and they cannot provide it themselves. Stall factions need a way to actually win the game. Indirectly, these line up pretty well. I spoke previously about how Wizard Princesses was my underrated combo. I used to think that it was the worst because of how I incorrectly categorized what those factions were looking for. It turns out that Princesses really want extra action plays because they have excess actions and only play one per turn, and the power-starved wizards want raw power, which the Princesses provide. The princesses also need low power minions to manage the power creep in mid-game turns, which the wizards provide. And again, this is a factor of circumstance, nothing on the particular cards that they're looking for. It's particularly funny to me because for need-need combos, the reasons why I see people knock a combo are the very reasons I end up liking them when approached from a different perspective. My entry to Unexpected Party was Ninja Horses, and I stand by that. Horses have no antagonism, and they also burn themselves out. Ninjas provide both destruction and efficient second places to offset the horse solo potential at an extreme cost, but ninjas need something to do most turns and a way to win bases. One of the strengths of these combos is that they are often surprise synergies that catch people off guard. If it is difficult to form a game plan, 
then your rivals will have a hard time fighting against what they don't see coming. It often leads to surprise benefits, like Ninja Acolyte and Rainbow, or locals powering up Gorgonzola. These combos have a higher risk for draw order potential than others, but a lot of support factions fall into this category, and support factions, in my experience, tend to have a better cast breakdown, particularly on advance and expand plays, because that's what it means to support. Also, because their strategies are so diversely different, it makes it very difficult to counter. Yeah, you can view Kaiju and Innsmouth through the lens of extra plays, but the spies can bleed Innsmouth of locals and locals can just get them back, and Kaiju actions are extremely uncounterable, so what do you do in that situation? I think the success of need-need combos comes down to how you perceive their value proposition, what they offer and what they need. You tend to see a lot of underrated factions make up these, like your Star Roamers, Mad Scientist, and Princess types, which makes them relatively safe draft choices because you can surprise someone and find a lot of value in the back half. One of my favorite combos of recent memory that fits this example is Star Roaming Shield from the first day of Smashing. I wouldn't blame someone for thinking that this is a have-have combo because Shield is definitely Swarm and Star Roamers have Swarm tendencies, but that's not how I approach the combo. Shield needs efficiency, and there are many ways of solving efficiency. You can give them more bullets, but you can also give them protection to keep the bullets they have. They need a means of setting up a mission debriefing play that is also terminal to get the best bang for your buck. Star Roamers need a way of setting up the board presses to establish their engine, and Shield extra plays do that. Shield also benefits from the stall of Star Roamers. This shows that individual cards can align on multiple categories, which is a good thing, since it helps against draw order and gives more dimension to the combo. What I loved about this combo is that it fundamentally changed the Star Roaming plan. I'm not moving Ship's Captain to another base, I'm intentionally returning it because I want full control of my burst, but Star Roamers can't do that alone. That is the type of unexpected game plan that wins games, especially since I offered Star Roaming Shield to other players, and they all turned it down because they didn't see the atypical synergy. There is another recent need-need combination that has gained quite a bit of attention lately, and that is Warrior NATO. I don't remember whose tournament it was, but they ended up winning it all and maintaining constant control of the board. Tornadoes need minions to move, often this is rival minions, but warriors give them additional targets that suit their needs. Warriors have a very specific game plan that not a lot of factions can influence since monsters increase their breakpoint and they draw benefits from their existence. Because monsters do so much for them, the warriors want constant obstruction recurrence, not you killing every victim. I call this principle Kornyikov. Kornyikov demonstrates that the warriors are a state machine that adds monsters and then removes them. Some of the cards do double dipping. The problem is that this makes them draw order dependent, and some of their destruction is power capped, forcing a few key cards to carry a lot of the load. However, Kornyikov also implies that moving monsters is far more effective, because it keeps the monsters in play to keep the warrior engine going. This is particularly powerful with monsters that gain benefits from monster swarms, like Night of the Living Dead. Additionally, warriors greatly appreciate the tornado specials. They can persist the big hero. Tornadoes don't really have a logical candidate in-house for their specials, but the warriors do. Instead of two plays to play the big hero and eternal hero, Gone with the Wind can save two plays and keep tempo. This further accelerates the game plan of Kornyikov because you can move a monster with carried away and then move big hero after the base scores, using the monster as a giant shield for you to eventually destroy. Warriors need additional, admittedly better ways to deal with monsters, and tornadoes oblige while having their needs of targets met at the same time. Smash Up is a complicated enough game that you cannot distill every interaction into a simple list of categories, but these five categories cover the vast majority of cases. While no one seeks out to create a need-need combo specifically, the lesson here is that value can be found anywhere, and the best players look beyond the surface to find hidden combos. To close this video, I wanted to address one of my most common questions I get asked, what is the best combo overall, usually with the intention of that player wanting to obliterate their friends. And I rarely answer that because my honest answer is this, I don't know and I don't care. Combos shouldn't be capable of that. It's bad for the game and it's bad for the game's players because it's not fun. One of the knocks against Smash Up particularly early on is that the combos are wildly unbalanced, but I think that this can be mitigated by looking deeper. Hopefully, as a new player, this video helps you do that and see the game for the 95% of combos rather than the 5% uber combos. Which of these combo types is your favorite, and do you have an example of that? Let me know in the comments. This video and other videos in this series will air on Saturdays because March is always my busiest month of the year, and this year it is worse than ever. With these videos being naturally longer and requiring more graphics, I'm giving myself an extra day each week to help ensure their quality, knowing that I am stressed out of my mind. But don't worry, Friday afternoon will return when things come down. 
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Let's shut it down.